Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started in the interest of time and lunch, probably more emphasis on the latter. So um, just to orient you, you are all in the Boston uh, ballroom waiting for a presentation on better parking design for more attractive, walkable, and sustainable neighborhoods. Um, my name is Hayes Morrison, and I will be moderating this session. I am the Director of Transportation Infrastructure for the City of Somerville. Uh, with me are a whole slew of people you can ask questions about Somerville um, from after the presentation. They all need to raise their hands. Come on, guys. OK. Um, so what we're going to focus, we have three speakers today. Excuse me. We have um, Aaron Ben-Joseph from MIT, who is the head of the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Um, he has written several books and um, articles on um, streetscapes, including Streets in Shaping the Towns and Cities, Regulating Practice, Standards of Shaping Urban America, The Code of the City, Renew Town, Adaptive Urbanism and the Design of the Low Carbon uh, Community, and Rethinking a Lot, the Design of Culture and Parking. So um, he's going to be our first speaker, followed by Stephen Cecil, who is um, the principal of the Cecil Group. Um, Stephen is a sought-after speaker on the subjects of neighborhood revitalization, transit-oriented development, zoning, and often speaks on the importance of the role of parking plays in creative, in creative sustainable walking neighborhoods. He has taught uh, both urban studies and design planning at Harvard and MIT. Uh, following that will be Tim Love of Util Design, who is a um, founding principal of Util. He's vice president. Before that, he worked for um, Mikado and Silveretti Associates, and um, at one point was actually the project dire director for the Getty Villa in Los Angeles. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's a beautiful place. You should check it out. So um, with that, because of the setup here, I am going to exit the stage and hand the, the uh, microphone over to Mr. Ben Joseph, who's going to give a presentation. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so I'll start. I'll try to be brief. Uh, what I concentrate on is uh, basically talking a little bit about uh, the design of surface parking lots. Um, I think I don't have to convince you about the importance of the issues of dealing with parking. Um, I, I think as we've seen in the morning, this is something that um, all of us probably agree on that it needs to be addressed. What I'd like to do is really talk uh, very briefly about the surface parking lot. This is something that uh, I've been uh, struggling with and writing about and teaching about, and particularly with dealing with students who have to design surface lots, and many of you do need to do that, whether design or plan for those. And my argument is that, you know, surface lots are here uh, to stay for a while. Uh, whether we reduce them or not, we still have to design them better. And uh, when I started this journey, particularly looking at the design of the lot, um, I wanted to come up with some ideas about how to improve those and really to have that as a way by which we engage with, that, with these, uh, this particular land use in a much more creative way. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about some principles, and then we can talk about um, if there's questions about how those can be implemented. Um, <clears throat> the surfaces, surface lots, again, the argument in terms of those taking um, so much of our urban spaces, we've seen this downstairs at the lecture by Noam Shoup, and there are many uh, indications of those. Um, but even in a place like Boston, uh, probably about 30% of the land is taken by surface lots. Um, Obviously, if you go out to suburbia, it's way more than that. Um, there are just a rough estimate that there are probably about 4,500 square miles of surface lots in the United States. That's more than um, the size of Puerto Rico. So what I say is that within the American context, parking lot may be really the most interesting um, element in terms of changing land use and design. So what I'll try to do is really talk about uh, kind of a lot of excellence. And uh, you know, many of you might know the book, uh, Great Streets. And my, my aim is that maybe in five or even less than that years, there'll be a book called Great Parking Lots. Um, <laughs> why not? Why not? So uh, just a couple of principles. One is kind of the idea of integration of a parking lot into a design, integration out. I'll show some example. Um, kind of the idea of flexibility and complexity. Um, parking lot as an event place, uh, as a garden, uh, as a place to deal with water issues. Um, 
parking lot is culture and art, um, is remediation, and um, basically paying more attention in terms of design and how we can deal with it, particularly in terms of activism. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about, really, as we design parking lots, and there's uh, no reason why not to do that, parking lots are really are the first and last part of a space we visit, live next to, or come to shop at. And if we can uh, think about those, it's not just like, a, okay, here are the demands, here are the requirements, but this is really something that is integrated in the design of a place, uh, we can do much better. This is an example um, of uh, the DSN, this is an example of uh, good designs. So I'm not necessarily going to show you bad design, but you probably all know that. Uh, but here is an example of, a, of an actual integration of the parking lot, a part of the sequence of entering a place. It was very deliberate. Um, the, all the way from the detail, the approach, um, as you come in, I don't know if this has a, as you come in, um, right here, you, there's a drop off. You come out, the whole grading of the site and part of it and, uh, that was done in terms of moving in and out. So it's not seen as just an external part or another part, let's park and then get into the museum, but it is really part of the design. So this idea of uh, integration in extremely important. This is another, this is a place all of you may know, and I actually personally think this is some of the best example of a surface parking lot. This is the parking lot of Porter Square. Um, and what's interesting about it, whether you like, you know, the, the zebra lines or not, the idea is that there's really a thought here about the integration of the, par of the parking lot. I'm not going to talk about Somerville, which is the other part of that parking lot, which needs to be a little bit more like the Cambridge side. But at least on the Cambridge side, um, you know, there is a tension. There is a, a tension to the way that parking lot relates to the street, the dimension. And what's wonderful about here, any of you have been there, is in the summer to see the activities that are actually happening here in terms of uh, chairs and in terms of tables. Uh, one of the things I like about this place is that it shows the difference of how we behave in parking lots. All of you probably can relate to that. Uh, if you're a pedestrian, you really feel that you have ownership over the space. It's often you see that if you come to park in that place, and if you ever did, um, it's quite frustrating as a driver. Um, and that's something about the design of the place that says, even though this is a parking lot, this place is really more for pedestrian. And this, uh, that's an interesting point in that sense. Um, I've also seen there, and I love observing the kind of behavior of how, you know, as a driver, you hate all the, all the people who are on bikes and you hate all the people who are walking. The minute you get out of the car, you hate all the drivers. And I've seen people coming out of the cars and actually punching cars that they think are driving too fast. There's also something nice about the dimensions and so on, but there's, again, just a simple parking lot with, you know, all the way from Dunkin' Donuts to Panera Bread, and it still feels okay. Um, again, this is part of this idea of the flexibility and complexity of a space. Uh, it is tight. Uh, it's not exactly maybe up to the exactly transportation engineering standards, and it does feel more, I think, as a kind of a shared space rather than a parking lot. So something just right here um, in our own uh, backyard that can be learned and, uh, and uh, can, you, can be used as an example in terms of how to design a place. Um, this flexibility idea is very interesting because if you think about it from a design standard perspective, unlike streets, parking lots are actually pretty flexible in terms of the requirements. Most, uh, you know, if, if those of you working for a city or those of you working uh, for the private sector know that uh, most of the requirement will be the numbers of parking, ingress, egress, you know, you know, where do you do the curb cuts, but maybe how many trees you have to put in, but that's it. Um, and many, uh, I think, kind of creative developers and other architects and designers have used it as an opportunity to actually change the area itself. These are some examples from new urbanist development um, in Florida. And one of the things that was interesting to me is that all of these actually are designated in the land use category zoning as parking lot, but they're actually acting as streets. And what has happened here is actually Anders Duani, when I asked him, particularly on uh, on the uh, seaside project, what happened here? How did you create a, this street? This is a, a, a totally illegal street in terms of standards. There are no curbs. And he said, well, you know, what we did is we designated this area as a parking lot. Uh, and then we realized, actually, in, in terms of our own design, we knew that people would drive through it. And so when it was a parking lot, all of the requirements in terms of curbs and radii and so on were not really enforced as much as they are on streets. And so we actually were able to create 
a much better environment. Again, examples of those, and I always say sometimes within the private domain, when I say private domain in terms of development that are maybe not exactly under the public um, ground because either they're gated community under um, kind of community association, there is a lot to learn in terms of how they are changing the mold in terms of standards and regulations. Um, I always say, you know, think about if you go to Hawaii or Tahiti and you go to a resort, uh, and you take your car from the airport and drive to the resort, they'll pay a lot of attention to their parking lots. They don't want you to get into a parking lot that looks like a Home Depot parking lot. So why is that that those kind of places pay attention whether it is leaving some streets in pla trees in place or paying more attention to material? Why can't we do it in other uh, situations? It's not always about cost, it's just paying attention uh, to what's there. I mean, this is, this is a parking lot in Biloxi, okay, it's not in Tahiti. It's a casino, it's a low-end casino in Biloxi, but here because they paid attention to a, a tree that was that had to be kept, it makes a big difference, including in terms of the pavement, paving material. Uh, one thing that I learned when I, do, when I did this journey in terms of design is to actually realize, and we all know this, that a lot of what happened, particularly in the United States, in terms of culture and social activities, happens in parking lots. And not, why not celebrate it? Why not actually acknowledge that? Why not use it as part of what we do in terms of design? Um, and some places have done. Um, Somerville has um, a great the fluff festival and so on that is happening, often happens in parking lots, uh, movies in parking lot. New York has Shakespeare in the parking lot instead of Shakespeare in the park. And they're using parking lots in downtown where they are um, not busy during uh, weekends for uh, showing um, theater and so on. Um, so, you know, this is very much part of our culture and the U.S. culture and another, you know, part of growing cultures in other parts of the world, and can we use some of that in terms of celebrating the parking lot? Uh, I love these photos, actually. This is from downtown Boston, where some of the few open spaces in the 1950s and 60s were these empty parking lots near Chinatown. Um, so the idea of actually using it, multi-purpose use of, of those um, spaces uh, during weekends or other times for sports or other activities extremely important. Those can be organized or can be spontaneous. Um, you know, sometimes it's just as simple like this case in Bentley where they um, striped it very differently, both in terms of uh, and they, when the cars are not there during the weekend, they put the basketball hoops and kids play, or even it is if it's in a corner of a residential uh, parking lot. So again, something as easy as striping it differently or allowing or putting those things in can create uh, quite a different atmosphere. Um, the idea of vegetation and gardens, again, in terms of uh, creating more attention, that's not expensive. It's just that if you provide, you say 30% of the parking lot or 20% has to be vegetated, the question is how do you actually show and allow for it to be more of a designed, a landscape design, and not that everything, let's say, will be put in the corner. Uh, some places, particularly if you're concerned in terms of uh, the heat island effect and so on, such as Sacramento, California, have done a very specific um, regulatory mechanism by, by making sure that there is the right canopy. But again, those are things that has to do more in terms of design attention. Um, so the kind of idea of hybridizing spaces. I, I, somebody told me, you know, you will be asked question about snow and snow removal and so on. Um, <clears throat> this is actually the, the left photo is from Connecticut. Uh, so they do get a lot of snow. And you can see both the kind of the idea of the extra, par extra parking that is done, um, particularly with the big box retailers we heard um, before in the morning for the uh, Christmas or the after Thanksgiving shopping day that is done differently using uh, uh, grass pavers and so on, or even if you think about stadiums that do not need to have uh, asphalt, especially when cars are not parked there uh, every day. Think about how many times actually um, the, um, you know, Foxborough, the, the, the stadium is, is used in terms of parking during the year, and why is it that it all has to be asphalt? Uh, so simple solutions some, uh, of, of this sort, maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing, but definitely better than asphalt and definitely um, better in terms of environmental uh, mitigation. Uh, this is in, in Copenhagen, so I think it still snows there. Um, so this idea that you cannot remove snow if it's not asphalt, there's no place to put it, and so on. But, the, but actually probably could be even much easier because a place like this doesn't even have curbs. Um, so you know, typically here we often will say we want to have a curb and we have the tree inside that particular planter. Um, maybe we don't need that, and that could be actually easing in terms, easier in terms of plowing. 
So again, looking at those kind of, um, of spaces as kind of inspiration, I think is important. This is an example of, uh, from France, again, a parking lot that is actually near a stadium and near in Limoges, um, integration of the green space and the part again of the uh, sequence of where you um, go in and out. Using it as a mitigation for water often um, could be extremely useful. I think, again, it goes back again to what was mentioned in the morning in terms of PR and education. Yes, if it floods, uh, people will think it's a failure, but if they understand that it's part of the system of stormwater runoff, and if you design it in such a way that it's maybe not more than an inch or two inch deep, then people will still tolerate it for a while. And instead of creating another extra detention pond and so on, the parking lot is here. Uh, and he is, it's possible to use it as a mitigation for environmental uh, issues. Uh, the fact is that all teenagers and many others and many of you and me included use parking lot for either kind of uh, uh, sometimes not, you know, 100 percent, I guess, um, I would say legal activities. Um, <laughs> Is an, important, is an important part of our culture. I love this. This is an example, actually, in New Jersey, they decided that there, there was a place to let teenagers meet and uh, do whatever they do with their cars. And instead of having them, them do it in the street, they allowed part of their um, mall parking lots during the weekend to be used that way. Um, again, it goes back again to just something as simple as designated a parking lot for workers. And I think in that sense, um, create an outlet and create a possibility for, um, um, for teenagers and others to hang in those places. You know, again, then these, these, there's so many examples, particularly for me as somebody who was not born in this country to see of the US and acknowledging maybe, you know, for may, many people who experienced it here that they see it as a, um, not as an important. This is, these are the uh, parking lot pickers, right? It's people who play bluegrass music. They go every weekend and they, that's how they, you know, do jam session and actually the whole idea is to meet randomly pe meet people and, and you know, you open the trunk of the car and you get the food and you have a good time and for that the car and the place itself could be celebrated. Nothing wrong with it, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, it could be more even in, in terms of art. Uh, this is a Marta Schwartz design is a drop off area in, um, in Anaheim in the Walt Disney but kind of celebrating the idea of a car and um, and the cones, um, again, kind of creating art in the place. Um, again, remediation, important. I think Don Shoup, I think he has, he didn't talk about it, but he actually made a calculation what will happen if you cover all the parking lots in Arizona with solar panels and instead of actually creating solar farms on greenfield development and found that probably you can create more energy. Of course, it's more complex because of ownership, but again, this idea that you can create uh, and use parking lots both in terms of shade and in terms of solar. Uh, why, are, why is the asphalt black? Anybody knows? I mean, there's really no reason to have the uh, pigmentation asphalt is, is a minor addition if it's not really adding to the cost. It, it's a major reduction in terms of heat island effect. And if you want to do it black, why not try to create some, you know, maybe you can use it to create some energy. Uh, steam and so on. There's been a lot of interesting startups that are trying to do with that. Um, there's um, there's even uh, kind of the idea of you know um, photocatalytic concrete and the idea that you can use this material to reduce um, nitrogen oxide and noxes and so on and so. Um, again, if, you, if they're starting to do this in, uh, in streets, why can't we do it in parking lot? Again, this is um, where, where we can use material, the hybridization of surfaces to do various, various uh, functions. Um, this is another great example where they try to encourage people uh, to walk. <laughs> so, you know, we all look for the, that, that, that elusive parking space and we cruise close to the, the door to the mall. And, you know, if there any advice I can give you, take the first parking lot, you probably lose less time than actually cruising, if, especially if the parking um, lot is full. But this is just a kind of an idea of, again, encouraging people to, if nothing else, by painting those areas and encourage them to walk uh, rather than to try to drive and park close to the mall. So design attention, again, this is just, uh, it's a place, and I'm giving you an example of some nice uh, uh, parking lot or what I consider something would be a great parking lot. Uh, this is from California, but again, 
uh, doing sto dealing with storm order, dealing with material, deal dealing with attention. It's not more costly than another one, another type of a parking lot. It looks much better. So I'm going to be done. This is just an example again of integration. This is from, uh, the, from Torino. This is a project by uh, Renzo Piano, where again the integration of the parking lot with the place. Activism is a great way to start change. You know, we've done a, a lot with um, the um, uh, parking day, and I always tell when we start to do parking day, title in the terms of parking lot day, uh, but things such as, you know, food carts and so on uh, that eventually get into the, into the uh, policy and get part of the, uh, this is again San Francisco, this is their street curb parking, but now they're actually moving into surface lot. This is near the Octavia Boulevard. This is a parking lot that is owned by the city. They've put a little, um, uh, areas here, they have a cafe, they have art installation, and, it's into, and you can see cars are still parked here, but it's part of the temporary installation that can use the surface lot until a building will come up here. So with that, you know, I would leave you with that and, um, and just ask you to consider the parking lot actually as an opportunity rather than a nuisance in terms of when thinking about it. And there's so many things that we can do uh, to move it from, from this to something that uh, looks a little bit better. And if you want to read more about this, you're welcome to purchase my book. So thank, thank you very much. So I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, but we're going to hold questions until all presentations are done. And then we're going to open it up to y'all since there are so many here. So with that, I'm going to introduce Stephen Cecil. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I've uh, been looking forward to this uh, for, for quite some time. It's a, it's a favorite topic uh, and a conundrum uh, for, for all of us. I thought it might be useful to remember that we're not uh, uh, struggling with this for the first time ever. We have a cultural history associated with parking. I'm going to focus on surface parking, uh, and, but of course the design side of it. And we've, we've been retrofitting New England as far as parking is concerned. Uh, uh, we, we have communities, this is Great Barrington, that was designed in an era when um, uh, the, 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 the horses and the buggies and the parking problems with those guys was probably pretty serious when you think about it. This is the first uh, image I ever found of back in parking. This is Great Barrington in the 1920s. Um, and uh, we have a space, but we have been trying to figure out how to use it. It's interesting that when you look in the 1920s and 30s, when cars were the hot thing and cool to have and parking meters were new, the, the design of the parking space, the cars, even the signage were all unified. Uh, so you have Art Deco um, uh, uh, style parking meters. Uh, of course, a kind of uniform character and styling of the, of the vehicles themselves. They indicated which space you should be paying for. Um, uh, all of it very well thought out. Uh, and there's just an overall sense of character that makes uh, uh, design an important element. But when you're in a community like this, and so many of our communities look like this, exactly how you pull off parking besides fitting it in where it can go uh, is, uh, is the issue that we all deal with. And of course, in fulfilling those ratios that retailers and businesses and zoning, uh, as we've been hearing about, called for, uh, the retrofitting often has meant simply destroying whole segments of, in this case, historic Windsor, Connecticut, in order to find places to put those cars. Uh, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what some of the future visions. So we, we do have a kind of uh, uh, antipathy towards the car. I think that Cadillac Ranch, this is a parking solution in a way. Let's just plain get rid of these things. Uh, uh, they have cultural value. But what you find in the images of the future villages, this is Southfield uh, in its early planning. Uh, South Weymouth Naval Air Station, well, there's not a parking lot or a parking space in sight. We like to have communities in which we think that the parking is going to go away. The one thing I would advise you all to do is to think of a few things. There are real-life market forces that require parking, particularly um, in instances where there is not a mass transit or a high-density population. The low- and middle-sized towns, the market forces are there, uh, but we have this planning dissonance uh, about parking. We like it, and we need it uh, uh, sometimes, but we hate it uh, uh, and dislike it at different times. And part of the challenge of design is coming to grips with all of that. Uh, one thing that we would strongly uh, recommend before you start designing or redesigning your parking is you really have to do the math. The math itself in terms of the amount of parking and where it is and how you're going to access it sets the stage for design solutions. 
uh, as we heard earlier this morning, uh, in many, many cases, there really is too much parking or enough parking available. But as you grow your downtowns, your centers, your communities, you do run into this uh, issue where additional parking is going to have to be provided. You may have lower parking ratios, but more parking required. It's a very hard concept to get across. In fact, we had a, a real challenge down in uh, Providence in the, the Knowledge District there, working with a community that was very much new urbanist oriented, and they were opposed to parking, but we could show that you could reduce the parking ratio substantially by having a walking community and better transit, but you'd still have more parking required as you grew it. Um, and uh, we found that if we use the term parking storage, however, uh, I'm sorry, vehicle storage instead of parking, people started to understand that we've got a storage problem on our hands. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is the, the notion that your, your parking solutions really depend upon setting that area-wide strategy in place. How much on street, how much off street, what's the role each one of those are playing, and that there is no right answer. Um, configuration is one of the things that is talked about quite a bit. Uh, a few things about that. Um, uh, if you have the depth to do it, uh, there are a lot, a lot of advantages to diagonal or even perpendicular parking. Emerging, and I'd mentioned that, the back end uh, uh, parking on a diagonal or even a uh, perpendicular basis is being recognized in terms of many of its advantages. Uh, I started out in Seattle, and there are streets where that's the way you park, and always have. You didn't know that it was really a trendy thing to do. But if you haven't experienced it and seen the advantages of safety pulling out, it's hard to recognize. But Somerville's done it. It's starting to emerge. So as you're working within your communities, uh, understanding what could occur, what the benefits of different arrangements might be for a particular street, but allowing people to go and see these places. And one of the notes you should be taking today is who's tried it, is it working, and having your committee drive over and see what happens. Now, when we think about parking and on-street parking, uh, the curb edge is actually a very interesting zone in the relationship to the parking spaces themselves. Um, uh, these are zones that, from a uh, sustainability standpoint, hold a lot of promise in terms of the character and the quality of the experience for both the parker, uh, parking motorist and the pedestrian can be uh, significantly improved in many situations. There are um, some challenges that you need to be thinking about because, as we'll talk about, uh, every, uh, uh, the, the pedestrian experience in and out of the vehicle and the sense of convenience is extremely important. We do find situations where the sustainability that's uh, uh, available uh, on the curbside in planting areas that can have quite a bit of vitality and become features uh, are important. People are pushing towards sustainability by putting uh, pervious surfaces in the street, on the street edge. And I would just challenge uh, us a little bit uh, that the, the, uh, the, the science isn't quite there yet. Uh, these, are, these are salty, oily, dirty places in New England. Uh, and if you're starting to load up uh, the root systems of uh, tr street trees with high uh, uh, concentrations of salt, uh, and getting that stuff into the groundwater as opposed to dealing with it through uh, a much better uh, drainage system, that may be a better design. It looks cool, but on the other side, on the sidewalk side, the ability to put uh, plantings and really integrate them in ways becomes important. When we did the uh, streetscape down in Falmouth, we actually, that the plantings there were a solution to a problem that had to do with uh, handicapped accessibility, getting people in and out of cars and across to, uh, 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 crosswalks and along sidewalks is very, very uh, 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 dependent upon uh, uh, parameters uh, for access. And in areas in Falmouth, we found they were simply too steep to have as sidewalks. But the problem as you start to develop these is how do people get in and out of the cars and you have to place them properly and place the trees because your um, uh, businesses and your motorists will be upset if uh, they're banging their cars into their car doors into those features. Some very simple uh, ideas about how to think about reducing the visual impact. Cars uh, 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 have a, a peculiar shape in that 
uh, they're, they're bigger and a lot more metal on the, the bottom side. If you cut them in half visually, the top is reflective and glassy, the bottom is big metal and rubber. And so uh, uh, being able to see into uh, a parking lot, this is on Newbury Street, and you really have blocked the view into the parking lot. Many people are uncomfortable in parking lots where they can't be seen. Um, but if you, if you think about solutions that cut the car off just at that half point, you're removing something like two-thirds or three-quarters of the visual impact. It's a very simple idea, uh, and it works every single time. Um, this is a, a community outside of San Francisco where they decided to put their public art as, as uh, a way of changing the perspective about the parking lot. This is a big box power center. Um, I'm not sure if it really works, uh, but uh, I couldn't get it out of my mind once I saw this place, and I thought, well, they're not rejecting the parking lot. They're beginning to think of it as a place where public art and playfulness can occur. And even this is a proposal for bicycle parking. I don't know how practical this is at all. I'm just imagining some issues with it. But the visual impact of, of dealing differently with what you're putting in parking lots uh, is a design opportunity. <laughs> Quick point, and this is following up on your... Your, your images and your discussion. Uh, we don't need to think about uh, trees when we're, when, we're, when we're planting them in paved areas in mundane ways. Uh, Michel Devigne from Paris, we had an opportunity to work with him on a project. And he really looks at grids and locations and types of plantings. And uh, one of the things that's always struck me is that when we do public open spaces uh, in greens in New England, we don't tend to use the military models or the Renaissance models. We have this kind of simple picturesque spacing of different species uh, and trees. Why don't we do that with parking lots? Uh, so here's a, a tradition. This is an actual existing parking lot in a place. Uh, there's just no reason why we can't have groves, but they don't have to be engineered as a series of soldiers lined up in neat little rows. But most of the landscaping done for parking lots is done by the, the civil engineer who's part of the project team. And you're lucky if a landscape architect has uh, any time at all thinking about the quality of that space. We have so many places where this could be done at virtually no uh, expense and ways to do it without loss of parking spaces that it's just a matter of time. And as you pointed out, the edges, the spaces within the parking lots can be much more park-like and directly contribute to the sustainability. And these kinds of installations, we see them out here, REI out on the, uh, uh, in Natick, for example, uh, with tax credits in hand, uh, uh, is just changing the way we think about lots. It makes all the sense in the world. Um, a couple of thoughts about parking paying for parking. I showed you that Art Deco. It's probably one of the last remnants of actual operating Art Deco design in the U.S. or the old parking meters that you see. Everything else has been lost. And even the design of the contemporary ones recall that. But we're losing these. I'm not thinking we should hold on to them as historic. But this is what's been replacing them is these payment stations. And the design of the payment stations that we have in many cases, this is a payment station that's trying to give you all kinds of information. Um, and the last thing you can figure out is how to pay for uh, parking or how your parking space is going to work. And I just want to point out uh, something about the as, we, as we're working on the design of these uh, components, working with the company and even the manufacturers to custom design these in the early phases is an open door. We don't have to take off what's the shelf. These are, in effect, custom built. They're not rolling off of uh, production lines. But um, something that just gives me the biggest kick is that in New England, it snows in the winter. And so these systems, so many of them, are reliant on parking uh, being marked on the curb. And this happened in my own hometown this winter with our new parking. And come on, we can do better than that. From a design standpoint, no matter how nicely you do the lettering, if it's on the sidewalk, it's going to disappear for, 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 for months on end. Um, I think that uh, uh, the notion of wayfinding, uh, there is a lot of interesting work being done on wayfinding overall. Uh, and uh, 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 I think that uh, Nelson Nygaard and, uh, has done some really interesting work. Uh, but one of the things that we find in working in communities is that uh, there's an, often an attempt to do a very fancy custom design. This is where parking is. And the fact is the simple blue P that you see, I don't know how many of you drove, how many of you parked? Uh, to get to this when they, when they came here. You know, those simple blue peas out on the, on the street can direct you very well, as opposed to the kind of um, uh, uh, specially designed uh, systems that people can't recognize 
Um, and so keeping it simple is very important. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that increasingly, as we saw in San Francisco, wayfinding isn't happening on the street and signs so much. It's happening within the cell phones and within the, the website access. And it's such a great system overall that thinking about how you can participate, how you can get websites uh, uh, set up to do that kind of directional, even in a simple um, and smaller town environment, is important to understand. We were uh, engaged by the town of Concord working with the HCD to try to understand how wayfinding uh, signage ought to work in their uh, historic center. And the historic community is sort of allergic to new signage, additional signage. for for. And it's kind of understandable, right? It's sort of a genuine looking thing. And, uh, but we also said, well, hiding the signage and making it illegible is not part of the answer either. And that if you actually look at where the signage is uh, or the kinds of um, uh, wayfinding, there probably are places where if you just are, are nice to people, they will stop asking you questions and go where they want to go. But um, uh, what we've also introduced the town to is the notion that wayfinding will be on cell phones. They are going to have QR codes. And you can change the information or add and subtract the information over time. The, cell phone is, the smartphone is ubiquitous. Uh, and the kinds of information you can provide, if you have a few queuing places, it'll be a very subtle part of the environment. And we will see people who um, uh, have the this, this story. There's an artist in Seattle. Uh, Buster Simpson, uh, who did a wonderful piece, uh, which is on a stairway uh, around the Pike Place Market. And underneath the, um, the railing, as you walk up this steep hillside, there's a story. And it's designed for the visual impaired people, the, the people who are blind and uh, have blindness in, in Seattle. And underneath the, uh, the railing is uh, a Braille story. And you start from the bottom and walk to the top. And apparently, it's obviously very funny. I've watched people do this. And I'm told it's, um, it's pretty racy. It's a pretty good story. Um, but it's invisible to everybody else. But for the, the visually impaired, they get the story. And I think that as we see wayfinding in the future, there are so many different stories. And there's so many different ways of understanding our environment that if we find some places as anchor places to begin that story, we're going to have a much richer way of getting people around. So as we look at parking, and you're looking at what parking is, it's part of a voyage within your community. It's getting there, it's getting there clearly and having a good experience, but it's part of community building. And that voyage then from the car to that destination and the quality of that destination, if it's great, your parking is also great. If it's not great, your parking is not a solution. So it's not about technology, it's not about a particular aesthetic, it's about the putting together of a comprehensive, thoughtful environment scaled to who you are. Um, I've been popping uh, uh, this microphone all along, um, but I'm at the close of my uh, presentation. I'll look forward to answering some questions later on. Um, but it's a very, very important topic. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about um, parking garages, not parking lots. and. Um, uh, maybe fill out the story about some of the design issues that are on the agenda today. Um, one of the things that um, uh, uh, is important to realize um, is that almost every city and town in Massachusetts thinks they need a public parking garage. And, um, and my experience with this topic uh, runs back to before the Great Recession when uh, Mass Development and Secretary Bialecki's office teamed to commission our office to uh, put together a short illustrated white paper on how to field all the requests for public parking garages, um, to come up with some kind of policy so that the requests for parking garages and the funding uh, wasn't purely dictated by politics and um, your friends in the state house and that kind of thing. And so what we ended up doing was um, looking at three broad topics around parking garages. Um, some questions around due diligence and whether a municipality needed a parking garage or not, and what some of the metrics would be to determine that. Um, what some of the planning and conceptual design issues would be to frame um, and help both the state and municipalities decide what a good parking garage was and wasn't, and what the road might be for, to, to permitting. And I'm not going to go through the, the 
the full set of recommendations, but we did look at a couple of important categories around this issue. One was the cost value decision about the upfront capital costs of different uh, structural types against the long-term maintenance of garages. This was a, um, a pet issue of Bob Culver, who was the head of mass development at, at the time, which is uh, the expediency of certain systems, um, the costs against uh, a 20-year operations plan. Um, we also looked at parking garage layouts to understand efficiencies really as a way to manage up to people that were making these decisions while architects and planners understand the way that different layouts work in terms of efficiency and uh, quality of service. People that were making decisions about parking garages didn't. It was, in, in a way, a kind of a primer on the issues. Uh, this is a, our, our piece on uh, some of the structural uh, engineering choices, some of the constructability choices of parking garages. And probably most importantly at the time, um, uh, this was done 2006, 2007, um, we uh, began to look at ways that embedded in the policy of funding parking garages that uh, certain principles would be uh, uh, come with uh, potential funding. And one of those included the idea that for transit parking garages um, that the MBTA might consider in partnership with a town or city, that the garages wouldn't be built immediately next to the station, but might be, might be built a couple of blocks away to promote transit-oriented development, that there would be a downtown that would benefit from commuters walking from a parking garage to a transit station, that it wouldn't be um, the most convenient way to get in. And this felt, this was not, um, in, a, in the discussions we had with the MBTA, the most popular one of our recommendations, by the way. Um, we also talked about stormwater management, and as uh, Steve and Aran have both discussed, the way that the garage itself could be scaffolding for a, a photovoltaic system. Um, we've also uh, worked uh, directly with cities through a variety of funding sources. Um, Joanne from Hyannis is here. This is some work that we did for Hyannis, uh, looking at the relationship of parking lots to the ferry service there, but ways that improving that situation might also provide uh, a better priced and better uh, located parking for the downtown as well. It included a suite of recommendations for how a public parking garage might be associated with co-development to both hide the garage, but also to drive other kinds of economic development initiatives. Um, and um, also work that we've done through mass development funding, a parking garage study that we did for uh, Medford, which proposed a combination of strategies for a garage as part of the funding for a garage in, in, in that city as well. So uh, we've been involved um, um, with a, a quite a few projects at the intersection of funding, uh, policy decisions, and design decisions, um, really at the kind of planning stage. Um, we're not parking garage architects, per se. And we're now involved with a lot of these issues working with the Convention Center Authority as they plan the new urban district associated with the planned expansion of the BCEC um, in South Boston. What I wanted to mostly focus on today was a conceptual project that we did just a couple of months ago. Um, we put together a team that included Iran, who's here today, who's already, who's already spoken, um, our content sponsors today, Nelson Nygaard. Um, we put the team together um, and submitted our qualifications to be picked uh, by the Long Island Index, which is a nonprofit that looks at planning issues in Long Island. Um, to be one of four design teams paired with a Long Island downtown to do a conceptual design for a TOD parking garage. Um, and so 88 teams submitted their qualifications. We were lucky to have gotten picked. And we were paired with uh, the village of Rockville Center, which in many ways uh, looks and smells like um, a, a, a medium-sized city or a large town in the Commonwealth. Um, there's a, a walkable downtown near the train station, but also a lot of surface parking lots uh, where one would like to see transit-oriented development. Um, a little bit about Rockville Center. Um, uh, this is the Long Island Railroad coming through. It's actually an elevated train. Um, the structure of the train itself is very nice. It's from the 1940s. It has a WPA era quality to it. Um, and you can see that um, it's a fairly dense downtown, but the commuter parking lots are part of the scene. 
Uh, there's three big surface lots that make up the majority of the parking. And most of those spaces are actually reserved for village residents. Uh, much like Metro North and Connecticut, um, these stations are really meant for local consumption because of the politics of the ownership of the lots. The lots are actually owned by the village and not the Long Island Railroad. Um, and what's interesting about Rockville Center is that uh, it has both walkable sidewalks, but in the middle of the blocks, um, it's where most of the people that go to these businesses, restaurants, or stores actually park. So there's a funny dual culture there from an urban design standpoint. You've got some sidewalk culture, but a lot of the real social action is happening in the parking lots mid-block, and most stores actually have two entrances, one on the parking lot and one on the sidewalk side. Um, one of the challenges with this project um, uh, was to both propose a parking garage and be clear that the overall policy for a village like this is to reduce the reliance on parking, on, on, on single occupancy vehicles. And this was a, a tricky issue, both in terms of the actual math, but also the politics of getting a parking garage uh, approved. Because a lot of, like a lot of uh, towns in the Commonwealth, when the parking garage finally comes, it means that you're a city and no longer a town. It's the symbol of um, becoming a little bit too much like an outer borough of New York City. And so how we discussed the parking garage in the public discourse became an important issue. Um, so here's the elevated train line um, and the stakeholders that um, were an important part of this process. The railroad itself, which wants to increase um, parking uh, capacity at the stations. Um, the Nassau County Planning Commission, which is actually quite progressive in terms of TOD development. Uh, there's some very smart people there. Um, and the, the, the village itself, which um, uh, is ambivalent about a, a parking garage, to say the least, because elections are won and lost, of course, over issues like this. So we have little thought bubbles from each of these people wondering and biting their fingernails about what's going to happen. Um, so our uh, strategy was to um, not propose one giant mega parking garage, but to break down what we perceived to be the parking demand into three phaseable parking garages um, so that the, the village could start incrementally um, to uh, test the waters politically but also to see if the demand was really where, there in terms of increased parking revenue through permits, uh, X, Y, Z. And um, our strategy was to come up with a garage design that would riff off of the existing elevated train line. And so our proposal was to, uh, since the train was on these beautiful um, kind of WPA columns, our garage would be on beautiful arches. Um, setting up a kind of horizontal datum in the city, um, a structure that would be inexpensive um, but would have architectural qualities that weren't about an applied skin but would be intrinsic to the structure itself. And the idea was that our garage, in a way, would be um, occupiable in different ways at different times of the day, but even over the course of its lifetime. We wanted to make the ground floor so compelling that it would attract in the future uh, restaurants and, and retail to come back in and occupy the arches the way those things are actually happening with historic train viaducts, for example, in places uh, and, and bridges. Um, and the way we would do that is that the ground floor arches would be inexpensive tilt slab concrete construction, the same construction type they use for a, a, a large big box retail. And so you would pour the arches on the ground tilt them up and then do the next one with the same formwork like dominoes down the line and then put the inexpensive precast structure on top. Uh, we wanted to put the, the, the extra cost in the structure and not in a skin that might, not, uh, might be dated over time. Um, and then we developed it as a prototype actually. Since we were gonna do three garages and not one in Rockville Center, we had half an eye that we were convinced the Long Island Railroad that this could be the prototype for all of the garages up and down the Babylon line. And so we worked with Bureau Happel in New York and came up with a flexible kit of parts that, that reduced the number of uh, form work to a minimum, uh, was part of a precast system, and it could be a kind of plug and play, not just in terms of the structure, but way other programs could plug into it. And so um, 
Uh, here's the garage um, prototype. Um, the idea is that during the work week, the ground floor would be occupied by parking when the demand is high. And then on the weekends, you would close the arcade and open it up for uh, all kinds of civic events, flea markets, um, high school pep rallies, the, the kind of um, other kinds of alternative programming that Iran talked about, uh, movies in the evening, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the structure would also be designed in terms of the column grid and its logic so that you could build housing on part of it along the edge of it and that the floor to floor of the ground floor, which is at 20 feet, would allow shops to move into important corners, let's say, from an urban design standpoint. And then importantly, um, we propose that the structure of the garages uh, uh, be engineered so that the garages themselves could actually be repurposed uh, if the parking demand went down. The idea would be that these would be the 21st century of 19th century loft buildings, that the structures would be so robust and beautiful that um, when parking demand went down, you could either take over the entire garage as an office building, let's say, or parts of it for other kinds of uses and functions. And so this was actually built as a department store, but that was our vision of one possible future for these structures. And so um, the, the way the math works is not important to this audience. If this was Rockville Center, um, there'd be a riot in a second. But um, these are the uh, existing parking spaces in the lots. Um, our three proposed garages. Um, uh, and so oh, still working with the numbers and proving the prototype would work from a, a numbers and math standpoint was very important. Um, and the idea is that because the underside of the track are so beautiful and underappreciated really by these villages along them, our proposal was to turn that into a pedestrian and bicycling realm. It's free covered space and it's really cool. And to have our arcades actually plug into this as a pedestrian system. So all of our garages tow into the undercarriage of the track and it's almost like ancient Rome, right? Where um, you get a kind of covered pedestrian world that makes sense even in terms of larger connections. Um, that system actually connects to the park system of Rockville Center. Um, we, um, the, the mayor uh, was very eager. Um, a tennis facility had really recently been torn down. And he said, whatever you do, uh, give me some tennis courts on the roof of one of them. And so when the mayor speaks, UT listens in case there's some potential clients out there. <laughs> um, so we put an enormous tennis bubble on top of one of these. Um, uh, and uh, what, what's fantastic about it is that um, uh, some architectural historians wrote me and said, you know, Tim, it looks a lot like the, the, the Basilica in Vicenza by Andrea Palladio. And you've made, with the tennis bubble, a parking garage look like a true civic building. So that was a, a happy outcome of our, of our, design, of our design efforts. Um, and this is a, an image of a typical weekend day in our arcade um, and what life might look like um, in Rockville Center. So that's, that's it. So we are running a little bit behind on time. Um, I just kind of wanted to sum up the presentations. Though each one of them was a little bit different, there does seem to be a running theme through all of them that um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And that if you can just activate these spaces, especially in an area like Boston where uh, space is so constrained that everything has um, a beauty or utility in use. Um, we in Somerville, and I think some of you actually showed some slides from Somerville, so thank you, um, have been working internally on our own to look at different ways to use parking. Uh, right now, we have been doing a back-end angled parking, what was a um, pilot project on Bow Street, which is now going to be permanent as of this year. And we invite any of you who have any questions. Again, we've got three ringers over here who can answer all of your questions. Um, we've... Um, actually used one of, in Union Square, one of our own municipal parking lots, we actually allowed a restaurateur to rent or basically pay the meter fee on four spaces for the entire summer, which he uh, used for a beer garden. And it worked out really well for everyone. Um, additionally, we have taken on-street parking for bike corrals and hubway stations um, to a mixed review. We think it's pretty awesome and people who bike think it's really, really great. Um, it's been an adjustment for the community. 
And um, also, I think someone showed a picture of Fluff Fest that we actually do in a Union Square parking lot every year, and people really enjoy it. It's probably one of the coolest parking lots you can ever go to. Um, I personally don't tell anyone, don't like Fluff, but it's still worth going to the festival. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to open up the floor to uh, questions. So OK, over here. Plus, get the Harvard School of Public Health. I know all of you. Thank you very much. The research that I do is on bicycle facilities, and I thank you for the mention the pictures about bicycle facilities. Today, we really do want to reduce the numbers of parked cars. There has been mention of, well, have the hubway, have some bike parking, but we haven't talked about how we're going to enable the bicyclists to safely bicycle. If we have parallel parked cars, that's taking up the space of what is a protected bike lane, a Dutch cycle track. If we have angled parking, that's taking up the space of a Dutch cycle track. The only option is to put a bike lane in the roadside where the women, children, and seniors don't want to park. So I want to ask you, what about not just removing a few token car spaces for the park lets for bike parking, but removing the parallel park cars, at least on one side of the street, not putting in the bioswales in the sidewalk, which gets back to ADA, but copying the Chinese and putting a bioswale in the tree pit between the cycle track and the road, lowering your mobile source air pollution exposure for the bicyclist, and when you get to your parking garages, have not just underground parking cages, women don't want to go down in the basement cages with the grease and the oil, but instead have bike park homes that are street front level in which you have made that whole parking structure just as Tim did into a home that doesn't have eight foot ceilings, that has nine foot ceilings so that it completely can be retrofitted. How do we really put this bike, that's car parking on its ear? and we remove some of the cars that we can, and we bring in accessibility for the bicyclists. Uh, any uh, <laughs> I think you gave all the solutions. Let's do it. Right. <laughs> awesome. Uh, um, we, I'll take a little bit of a stab at that just to kind of um, sum up. We in Somerville actually are doing something similar to that where we are um, planning to remove uh, car parking on one side of the roadway to actually do a uh, cycle track, move the curb outbound, and uh, provide for that. And again, um, still controversial. Uh, but thank you for your what I'm going to assume is somewhat support on that. Um, but I, you <laughs> know, I, I I think that um, the best design streets are actually heavily negotiated. And I want to shout out to Livable Streets. I don't know if anybody is here from, all right, woo. Um, I, I think that, that organizations like Livable Streets that balance pedestrian, um, bicycle, and economic development issues are the best arbiters of the negotiated space of, of the street. And I, and I think that those outcomes are, as long as the state agencies that are overseeing them are listening carefully and are enlightened too, usually result actually in the best design outcomes. But the best streets are actually messy streets. That's my own personal opinion. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a different lecture and different talk, and I agree to that. I think that this kind of idea of going in overboard about separation of uses within the street, this is where pedestrians are going to be, this is car going to be, this is where bicycles going to be, it's actually not a good solution. The best places that work actually, as Tim said, the messy street. If you have a lot of bikers, then the cars will feel intimidated, they will not drive the same way. This is the best solution of actually traffic calming, is changing the use. So if you're gonna have thousands of people riding bicycle, a driver will be intimidated. And that's what I said about the Porter Square. Go watch Porter Square. As a driver, you do not wanna be there as a driver. That's the best solution. Having again this kind of, it's the same thing, it's the same idea about having a curb in the sidewalk. Why do we need a curb in the sidewalk? Why can't it all be one surface in certain streets? It's a separation of, again, the activities and the uses, and in a way what it does, it tells the driver, this is my space, you pedestrians should not be here. And it's the same thing if you cyclists, this is my space. So this is a different philosophy, but look at all the solution in the Netherlands and Europe, it's all about the messy shared spaces. 
So, you know, this is just a whole different argument, a whole different discussion. Uh, you're talking about parking lots, not streets right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> we have any other questions? Come on, yes, ma'am. Professor Ben Joseph talked about uh, kind of retrofitting existing parking lots, a lot of his ideas. We can kind of put them in. Steve, do you have similar ideas for existing parking garages? Will we get some of the good stuff that you can well, certainly, uh, parking structures, um, one of the things that we're learning, a number of the communities here are learning, is that parking structures don't last forever. They have, uh, and, and we are in the process of dealing with a bunch of outdated uh, parking structures. Natick uh, had to take one down, and now trying to take a look at what will replace them. So um, they really aren't permanent uh, in that way. Uh, the other thing, though, about them to understand is that, that because of the way they were constructed in the past, they're not easily adaptable necessarily. Um, so the structural systems that were involved with uh, T's or double T's, <laughs> getting a, a little bit uh, technical, um, they're not like uh, wood frame buildings that you can slice and dice them and rearrange them a little bit. But one thing I just want to emphasize uh, uh, about this uh, is that the walls, the sides of parking structures can really be adaptively reused. And there's quite a bit of interesting uh, uh, research and products looking at green walls where you literally start to bring the landscape up the sides of buildings. And they can be done very uh, uh, attractively, interesting ways, lots of design opportunities, and really transform that negative side of parking structures, which is the, the typical parking structure face and the impact it has on its surroundings. So I think that's an arena that we're going to be seeing a lot of projects over the next decade. Yes, sir. I'm curious if, uh, if I could get some comments from some of the panelists about uh, these uh, park, park in my backyard type of operation where the web people can rent their own personal spaces if they're going to work and then rent their space during the day to somebody else who would do it, uh, like Airbnb for cars, right? Yeah. What, what, what impact do you think it might have? Uh, oh. what, are, what are some things we might not suspect would be benefits or problems? Well, it's, it's, this was a really a, 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 you know, a very big issue um, uh, in, in many communities around commuter rail stations and around colleges and universities. This happens a lot. And um, uh, this is where, between zoning, having maximum standards and site planning standards for uh, residences, but uh, uh, it's going to be a long-term solution in those areas to unlock some of that. In the end, providing good quality, well, Natick is another example where there's a lot of that going on in Natick Center, enough so that it can actually become problematic in, um, in getting the vehicles into appropriate structures that would be much beneficial for everybody. Um, in the end, uh, this is where a public resource, parking as a public resource, if it's done properly strategically, can relieve some of that. But, it, but you get entrenched interests of those landowners, and that 85 bucks a month or whatever that's coming in is really hard to, 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 to change. Um, one thing I was going to mention, too, though, the, the, the advent of the electric vehicle um, uh, there was a, a designer up in New Hampshire that, that realized that with electric vehicles, of course, you don't need to park them outside. You can park them inside the house uh, in the future. And if you can just figure out how to get them to wipe their you know, feet when they come indoors. Uh, and that may be another solution, too. Any of the rest of you want to respond? You know, I, I say let a thousand flowers bloom with, with the Airbnb version of the parking thing. and. Let's have a chat in five years to see what the issues are. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if it should be regulated yet. I guess I'm, I'm Mr. Messy today, around like you. <laughs> Anarchist, messy. Yes, sir, in the red and black. We are coming from the town in Cape Cod, and um, this is not the right side of town or the suburban area in the shopping malls. This is a small fragile villages we are in. And it's a uh, third of the time that we have a lot of uh, visitors coming in, uh, four or five times more population during the summer. And uh, this is the impact with our uh, traffic. And uh, at other times, we don't need all that um, you know, uh, remedy for the parking uh, solutions or anything. But um, currently, we um, don't hear anything about the situation about where we are and um, the, whether we have any strategies or if we only experience about the deal with our villages with uh, 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 extraordinary population 
century sometime, and the whether we should be considering the parking lot or parking garage building structure, or whether there should be some level of control by the government, or whether it should be committee initiated or something like that? Well, I, you know, I, I think that um, Iran's example of uh, football stadiums that have turf parking areas for overflow, summer parking, is, is a perfect Cape Cod solution. We even discussed it with um, Hyannis when we did our parking study five years ago, that um, for seasonal summer parking that mushrooms, that, that might be an excellent solution that would result in fields that for half of the year aren't used at all. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm actually already starting to lose some of you because it's, we're getting into lunchtime. So what we're going to do is we're going to answer one last question, and then I think some of the panelists will probably um, stay around. Um, so I believe um, you in the front. Um, I'm sensing there is um, one physical player missing with, it, with the architect, with the planner and the landscape architect, and that's the urban design. Do you gentlemen sense that a non-accredited profession such as urban design is, should not be a part, a center, a center to the activities that you guys are doing? Um, I don't know, it says urban designer in my business card, so I... <laughs> I think that I think that um, I, I'd hope uh, maybe that uh, since some of the comments that I was making to really underline that because uh, um, uh, uh, we're urban designers too. That the thing that you have to be aware, uh, alert to, is the idea that somehow good design of parking is getting the right bunch of techniques lined up. Um, and if you don't have the strategy for what the entire experience is um, uh, and what kind of community you want to have when you're finished, then there is no such thing as the right technique. It can be the wrong technique. So uh, I think it starts from an urban design conception of what kind of community you're building and then drawing from, from a much broader range of tools than we had in the past. We can be much more imaginative from a design standpoint, but I actually think it springs. This is, it's, it, whenever you get into transportation or parking, uh, you're too focused, uh, bus, uh, you know, seminar on buses, and sort of it, but we're building communities. That's what we're doing. Uh, if I can add to that, you know, I think actually landscape architects and architects and urban design are the worst parking designers. I mean, look what we've done in the last 30. So I would just say, this is what I said, parking lots, particularly surface lot, have the most flexibility. Probably the best design could come from people who have, are not maybe professional artists, people who are concerned about how, it lo how this space looks like f through competition. This is a place you can generate new ideas because the requirement, generally speaking, for surface parking lot are extremely loose. So I don't know if an urban designer will do a, a better job or a landscape architect. Sure, they should be involved, but let's open. It's a great opportunity, just I think they did in Long Island, to open it, for example, for competition. Let some of your community take some of your surface parking lot and open it to competition, to students, to other, put you know two, three thousand dollars price and get and get some great ideas. If you look back at the history of awards for architects, landscape architects, urbanism, you try to find me when was the last time that a parking lot got a design award. <laughs> All right. So this is this is just shows the kind of interest that the profession has. The last one that a landscape architect received as award was in 1985. And the last competition that was done since recently was in 1984, was a competition called Carscape in Columbus, um, um, Indiana. Indiana, yeah. So there's really very little in terms of interest of the profession. So. So uh, with that, I think we all thank you for attending. Have a great day.